So I welcome you all to today's session of Galactic Fidelity webinar series. Uh, today our speaker is Dr. Preeti Kharb. Uh, Preeti is a faculty member at NCRA, that is the National Center for Radio Astrophysics in Pune, India. Uh, Preeti works on multi-wavelength observational uh, aspects of uh, AGNs. Uh, Preeti has finished her PhD from the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, located in Bangalore, India, and done her uh, PhD uh, postdoctoral fellowships at uh, RIT in Rochester, as well as Purdue University in Indiana. Uh, Preeti is also a member of the Mojave Collaboration. Um, she returned to in India in 2012 to join as a faculty member at IIA uh, before moving to NCRA in 2016. Uh, today, she is going to speak about outflows in Seaford galaxies. Uh, over to you, Preeti. Thank you, Shitish. Um, and thank you to you and Sam for inviting me to these uh, Galactic Fidelity Seminar Series. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking today. Um, and let me start by sharing my screen um, and hope that's all to be smooth. So is this all uh, visible? Yes, it is. Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, so I'm going to speak today on outflows in CFA galaxy. So this is a very, uh, as you can see from the title, a very broad topic. Um, and I'm going to talk uh, uh, mostly about the work we as a group have been carrying out in NCRA. Uh, and this involves a whole set, a whole slew of telescopes, uh, which I'll be talking about, which includes the Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope, or GMRT, which is run by our uh, institute, NCRA, in Pune. So let me start with this beautiful picture of a galaxy. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this galaxy. It's called the Whirlpool. And it's also called the Messier 51 or M51. This picture is here only to show that a galaxy is a collection of a huge number of stars, around 100 billion stars, and of course, gas and dust. But some galaxies are special. Let me see, it's uh, not moving to the next slide. Okay, hold on. It's got stuck. Oh, oh, okay. One second, huh? It's it's not actually moving to the next slide. Sure. This has happened to me once before as well, and I don't remember why. Okay, now it's moved. Yes, we can see the next slide. Okay, perfect. I have no idea how it happened, but let me see if it moves to the next one as well. Okay, good. Let me just go to this slide then. Um, so. It it was in the nineteen forties. Uh, Carl Seifert found out that. Uh, a small fraction of galaxies uh, were slightly different from the, the picture that I showed you in the previous slide, the whirlpool. So here you have two pictures of face-on galaxies, face-on spiral galaxies, as you can see, and both of them seem to have uh, an increase in the stellar density as you go through the center. But in the object to the uh, left, you see a star-like a point source, a bright point source, a star-like nucleus. And Carl Seifert uh, realized that uh, this was a, not a uh, regular galaxy. This was peculiar. And he collected a, a small sample of such galaxies with star-like nuclei and obtained their spectra. And interestingly, what he found was that well, uh, while normal galaxies show spectra like you see on the bottom uh, right, uh, which is basically a lot of absorption lines. So that is a typical spectrum of a galaxy. And these absorption lines are basically uh, coming from the stellar photospheres, the stars that make that galaxy. Um, so that the, solar, the photospheres of those stars then absorb um, light at certain uh, wavelengths and give you this absorption line spectrum. But on the uh, left, what you see is the spectrum of the star-like nucleus in this galaxy which is, as you can see very clearly, it's dominated by emission lines. So you see a lot of lines uh, above the continuum. 
And uh, so these and uh, this particular uh, slide also shows the species which are producing those emission lines. So there are a lot of high-ionization high uh, species. You see narrow lines and broad lines. By, I, I will talk about that in the next slide. Uh, by which I mean the velocity widths can be a few hundred kilometers per second to a few thousand kilometers per second. And so Carl Seifert, uh, these kind of galaxies which had star-like nuclei and emission line spectra were, are now identified as um, Seifert galaxies. Uh, the, in these and other, uh, other similar kind of galaxies which were found later, it was, it was found that the star-like nucleus could be so luminous that its luminosity could be, uh, could, uh, be greater than the luminosity of all the stars in the galaxy or even 100 times larger. So these uh, star-like nuclei have come to be known as active galactic nuclei or AGN. And as we'll see in the next, in the coming few um, slides, this uh, bright, this luminous emission is basically a release, due to release of gravitational energy as matter falls onto supermassive black holes. So uh, for almost 20 odd years, uh, not much happened in this field. And the next big, big breakthrough happened when uh, this object, which looks exactly like a star, you don't even see a galaxy behind it. Uh, this is um, a source called 3C273. And the 3C name actually uh, suggests that it's a radio source. So this, so it was basically it was 20 years later when radio uh, interferometry was possible that a lot of these starlight nuclei also seem to show radio emission. And this was one of those sources. So it was a radio source. And uh, when Martin Schmidt obtained a, its optical spectrum, uh, it, the spectrum is shown on the right side, he found it to be very peculiar in that uh, there seemed to be a lot of emission lines like Carl Seifert had noticed in 1940s. Uh, but these uh, emission lines seem to be very different from anything we observe on the Earth. And in laboratory wavelengths, for example, were completely off. And it took them a while to realize that the pattern of emission lines that they were seeing were actually similar to the hydrogen bomber series that is, is observed, um, uh, but they were highly redshifted. So the redshift here is the offset in the wavelength we observed to the emitted wavelength by the uh, emitted wavelength or uh, the rest frame wavelength. And that redshift turned out to be 0.158, which was extremely large. And it was clear that these kind of sources were extragalactic. Even though you see that there was no, you don't see any background source, any background galaxy to this source. Um, and uh, after the radio interferometric techniques, of course, got better, um, you could even resolve the radio emission from these sources. So 3C273, which was identified initially to be a two point, a two component object, turned out to actually have this core jet structure. So th that is what you see in the left panel. Um, the blue emission is, the blue color is actually showing the radio emission from this AGN. And on the right, uh, it took many years and the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope to actually carry out this exercise of um, uh, using a coronagraph, which basically blocks out the, the, the very bright light that's coming from the star-like nucleus to actually see the host galaxy behind it. So that is what you see in the right figure. Uh, the rightmost panel is the elliptical host galaxy that shows through once you block the point source, the star-like nucleus. So, so this is a quasi-stellar, now we call them quasi-stellar radio sources or quasars, uh, uh, 3C273. So it was after the discovery of 3C273 that, um, and then of course there were many more like 3C48 um, that the study of AGN kind of took, um, could start it in earnest. And after many years of, um, you know, uh, multivalent observations um, from going all the way from optical UV and X-rays, spectroscopic observations to actually see the emission lines absorption lines, et cetera. This kind of a model, this, this um, cartoon that you see here on the right has come into um, being. 
So this, the reason this card, there, there is a cartoon and actually not an image, I think uh, it will become clear to you, is because all this, all the structures that you see in this cartoon are too small to be actually seen by our, our uh, present day telescopes. So what we have in the center, this is what we believe an Aegean is. An Aegean is the center, uh, supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy. And uh, by supermassive black hole, I, I mean it has a mass of a million to a billion solar masses. Okay, so just remember that the, um, a galaxy consists of 10 to the 11 stars. So 10 to the 9 solar kind of equivalent of 10 to the 9 stars are already concentrated in this point source. This point source, um, uh, the, uh, the supermassive black hole, matter actually uh, kind of accretes, falls onto it, and the, the, it releases gravitational energy. It produces outflows, which you already saw a picture of in 3C273. You saw the blue-looking blue you know, core jet structure. And this cartoon shows the same thing here. Um, it shows these two uh, bipolar outflows coming out from that black hole accretion disk region. Then you see a lot of point uh, or you know, cloud kind of structures. Those are what we believe the gas clouds that produce the lines, the emission lines that you see, which was what identified or which Carl Seifert identified as a signature of, you know, an AGN. And it's believed now that uh, the broad lines, which I mentioned earlier in the spectrum, which have uh, widths of, you know, several thousand kilometers per uh, kilometers per second, they come from gas clouds which are very close to the supermassive black hole and accretion disk region. Um, so they are high dense clouds which are moving very fast because of the influence of the black hole itself. Um, and the narrow lines which also you saw in the previous spectrum come from similar clouds but less dense and further away which are moving slower. So these are moving with uh, velocities of a few hundred kilometers per second. So um, I already showed you one spectrum which seemed to have both broad and narrow lines in the previous uh, slides. These kind of AGN were later called as type 1 AGN, whereas there were some other AGN which seemed to only show narrow lines. So they were, the line widths were never more than a few hundred kilometers per second. And these were uh, identified as type 2 AGN. So this cartoon here is trying to um, kind of reconcile all these different uh, spectra and different manifestations of the same source in this way. So it's 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 believed that the central engine, which is the black hole and accretion disk, that's the central engine, and then there is these broadline clouds. That region may be actually hidden from certain lines of sight by this orange donut-like structure, which is called the torus, and it's it's not clear if the torus is actually like a donut. It could also be some kind of a warped uh, disk itself, which kind of connects to the equation disk. Uh, but this is for the purpose of our understanding, basic understanding, this will work. Um, and I, I, I mean, the, the point I want to uh, reiterate is that uh, the, the reason we don't know any of this and how it actually looks like for example, we don't know uh, how the broadline region actually, what is the morphology? Is it like a spherical distribution? Uh, is it a conical distribution? All that is not clear is because we haven't, our telescopes are not able to actually image these regions because these are very, very small. Okay, um, and I already mentioned jets are uh, launched from the secretion of this black hole system. Um, what we do know as, is that these jets uh, First of all, they comprise of uh, charged particles which are moving at relativistic speeds. So these are relativistic charged particles. They're moving in um, uh, regions of high magnetic fields and these charged particles then give rise to synchrotron photons. And synchrotron photons are the ones that you see, I mean, that, that light that you see from the radio jet is synchrotron emission. So, so we know that this is this plasma that is being thrown out is a relativistic plasma um, and a synchrotron emission. Uh, what is very interesting is that the plasma, the bulk speed of the plasma, so not only the individual electrons, but the whole collection of electrons is also electrons and protons, uh, all charged particles are also moving at relativistic speeds. So that means the, the, the jet itself is moving at relativistic speeds as well. 
this then has a lot of interesting um, uh, interesting um, ramifications because the special theory of relativity then you know comes into play because we are talking about speeds which are close to speed of light and that can produce a lot of very interesting effects like superliminal motion which i'm not going to talk about in this talk today but i'm happy to discuss if anybody's interested and also it can produce what seem like one sided jets that i will talk to you about in the coming slides so these that the recipe the recipe of the agn or, or you know the various components that make an agn they were very clear in the previous slide how do we know these exist right so the fact that there is a supermassive black hole is now um, there is no question about it this is an image of um, actual stars around the galactic center uh, of our own galaxy the center of our own galaxy where the, we believe there is a supermassive black hole and it's been confirmed because you see actually uh, if you observe stars around the galactic center uh, the center of our galaxy we have been observing them now for 20 odd years so you can actually see complete orbits of these stars um so then if you just use very simple uh, newton's uh, form of the kepler's third law uh, you can actually derive the mass around which these these stars are moving and using just this very simple formula v square r by g uh um, we know we actually know their orbital velocity we know the separation you actually see the complete orbits and you know the gravitational constant so we know that there is a supermassive black hole in the center of a milky way which is 4.5 million solar masses and because of this work um of course the last year's nobel prize was awarded to roger penrose reinhard gensen and andrea gess so i'm sure you're aware of this but the finding of supermassive black holes in other galaxies apart from our own galaxy which is course it's the nearest black hole nearest supermassive black hole to us um it's uh, the external galaxy black holes are not as straightforward because you can't resolve the motion of individual stars um in these external galaxies so what is used instead is the motion of the gas around the center so in this uh, three uh panels top bottom and uh top middle and bottom uh this is one external galaxy with an agn m84 which has been uh observed with the hubble space telescope um in spectroscopic observations there is a the middle one shows a slit uh where you actually find um the you can find indications of gas motion and so the bottom panel actually shows that the gas has red shifts and blue shifts and that uh the gas uh, speeds become extremely um they they the dispersion becomes extremely high as you go closer and closer to the center which means there is a supermassive black hole so it's following very similar uh, calculations that we did for stars in the in the milky way you can also estimate the a uh, mass of the black hole in these external galaxies and for example for m84 that turns out to be 3 8 10 to the 8 solar masses um for other galaxies where you can't even do this then uh, a lot of um, you know, black hole masses have been found using the method of reverberation mapping and again this is something i can discuss if somebody is interested uh, but we do know now that all massive galaxies have a supermassive black hole in the centers the jet formation itself so i showed you in the cartoon of course i showed you the jet but i also showed you an image of uh, the jet in 3c273 so jets exist and the formation of jets is another um, a very um, a topic uh, which is undergoing a lot of research uh, and there are uh, two primary mechanisms which have been put forth uh, theoretically um, to explain the formation of jets one is um the blandford and snyk uh, from the 1977 paper or called the, it's also called the bz mechanism and uh, this basically this uh, in this model you can uh, the you can extract energy and angular momentum from a spinning spinning black hole so you take the spinning black hole in the center of the agn and actually extract energy from it to power these jets okay uh what you need are um, strong magnetic fields lining the black hole i mean um uh, threading the black hole and uh, the spin will then produce will kind of cause a twisting of magnetic field lines that, which is what is shown in the cartoon here um 
and this then can serve as a, both as a channel for the charged particles to move in. It's also a way to accelerate those charged particles, etc. So the power that is is extracted in this mechanism is proportional to the strength of the B field, the magnetic field, as well as the angular velocity of the spinning black hole. So the more, the faster the spin of a black hole, the more powerful a jet that's produced from it. And similarly, if you have uh, a jet which has a greater magnetic field strength, then uh, you also have a more powerful outflow. The second um, favor, um, popular mechanism uh, has been also by Blandford. Uh, so this is Blandford and Payne from 1982. Here, what you do is you, uh, uh, the energy and angular momentum is extracted now from the equation disk rather than the black hole. Okay, so, so this can lead to some kind of um, uh, wind, wind like outflow. So maybe the outflows that result in this could be uh, people use it to explain uh, outflows which are not as collimated as, for example, the ones that could be produced in the BZ mechanism. So this cartoon here is to show, for example, a composite of a BZ and BP uh, mechanisms, which uh, is likely to actually be take, uh, is, is likely to be present in a lot of um, AGN, especially the AGN I'm going to talk about today, like uh, CFIT galaxies. So this cartoon, of course, the, the lines that are shown here are magnetic field lines. And then you see the in the uh, bottom um, left corner, you see the you know black hole. And then there is an accretion disk beyond it. And the magnetic field lines are uh, threading both the black hole and the accretion disk. And so the outflows are then uh, you know, being uh, ejected along these uh, magnetic field lines. So uh, before I talk about um, our uh, data and I mean the the the, um, the work that we've been doing, I wanted to also uh, just introduce the telescopes we've been using. So of course, JMRT, which is uh, operated by the by NCRA, uh, here is an image of uh, of the JMRT and the uh, panel. The sorry, the um, cartoon that you see here is how these antennas are distributed. Uh, so they are in the shape of a Y. Uh, with the maximum baseline, so which means the maximum separation between the antennas being around 25 kilometers. Okay, and so there are 30 antennas which have um, each having a 45 meter uh, diameter. And the frequency range of the GMRT, the frequency uh, operating frequency of the GMRT ranges from 150 megahertz to 1.5 gigahertz. So most of the observing frequencies are in the megahertz, uh, 100 megahertz range. And the resolution, um, uh, the resolution of uh, any telescope is given by lambda by d. Lambda being the observing wavelength, and d uh, for a single telescope would be the diameter of the telescope. But in this case, it's the baseline of this if of this uh, telescope array, which is 25 kilometers for GMRT. So the resolutions that we get uh, at these observing frequencies range from 25 arc seconds to two arc seconds. So for the, the AGM that we are studying, the, we are actually mapping um, the radio emission on kiloparsec scales. I mean, the nearby AGM, uh, arc second resolutions correspond to kiloparsec scales. So kiloparsec jet, uh, jets are what we are uh, observing. Another telescope we have used a lot of is a very large array. Um, and uh, VLA, uh, this has 27 antennas of 25 meter diameters, and this operates mostly in the gigahertz frequency ranges, range, um, with the resolutions, of course, are higher because it's uh, lambda by D, so the lambda is smaller, um, and ranges from 0.2 arc seconds to 0 0.04 uh, arc seconds. So this will map the radio emission on, uh, from kiloparsec scales to hundreds of parsec scales. Finally, um, VLBI. So VLBI is a, a technique, um, very long baseline interferometry, where you actually use antennas which are widely separated and they may not be connected by, for example, optical fiber or cables, unlike GMRT or BLA. And then you, uh, so this cartoon is showing how the, the principle of, I mean, how VLBI actually works. Uh, when you have two antennas which are far away from each other, not connected physically, then you, uh, both these antennas uh, sample, uh, for example, the same, same wave front from a far uh, high redshift quasar, for example. And they record the data and the data are time stamped with, with a very, very high accuracy by using atomic clocks. 
and then later you collect these data from these two telescopes and play them back and correlate them using those accurate timestamps. Okay, so this, this is, uh, and since you can now uh, increase because resolution is lambda by D, you can, if you increase D a lot, then you can keep in improving your resolution. So the resolution that you get by this technique uh, is typically in, in the range of milli arc seconds. Okay, so we were talking about arc seconds and sub arc second in the previous VLA and GMRT. Now we're talking milli arc seconds. And when you have milli arc second resolution, then you are probing radio emission on parsec scales in the AGM that we are looking at. This is an image uh, of montage, which I'm sure now uh, you may be already very familiar with. Um, this is to show how you know different spatial scales are imaged uh, uh, using different telescopes. So this is the famous AGN MET7. And on the top, you have a VLA image, which, which shows this you know, bipolar jets and lobes. And then you keep going to higher and higher resolution. So keep resolving the optical, uh, sorry, the unresolved point source, the core. And then you keep seeing a core jet structure at higher and higher resolution. Um, and at, at the final end, you use the Event Horizon Telescope, which is just a millimeter wave VLBI array. And then you can see the shadow of the black hole, which of course you've seen. Um, another thing I wanted to point out here is, you know, the you see the jets uh, seem to be one-sided, and especially the shows up in VLBA or VLBI observations. And uh, this is nothing but a Doppler boosting effect. So it's not that in the frame of the source that there is only one jet. Uh, the jets are on both sides, but you see the jet which is coming towards you as brighter and the one that is um, going away from you as dimmer. So then you end up, uh, because of your limited sensitivity, only seeing one-sided jets. So now coming to uh, the topic uh, or the sources um, of interest, which are Seaford galaxies. And I'm going to say Seafords, but they will also include what are known as liners. Uh, liners are low ionization nuclear emission line region galaxies, which were identified much later than Seaford galaxies. But they're very similar to Seaford galaxies. They're also found, uh, for example, in spiral galaxies, but also others. And the main feature is that uh, the low ionization lines are more prominent in these compared to Seaford galaxies. So, but if I just say, if, if I say Seafords, I sometimes also include liners in my. Um, um, explanations. Now, um, when we showed this a beautiful image of 3C273, we showed a core jet structure. You didn't see actually a counter jet in that image. Um, Seaford galaxies uh, also emit uh, radio emission uh, and synchrotron radio emission. Uh, but most of the time, they are not as impressive as, uh, the, for example, as 3C273. What you see uh, often are just point sources. And this is seen in the panel on the right. On the top panel, you see um, the red blue image is the optical emission coming from the spiral galaxy. And the green contours that you see is, is just an unresolved uh, you know, core. That is from the v a VLA image. So arc second scale image, kiloparsec scale image. And you don't see any jets, you don't see anything, you just see a point source, but there is radio emission. Um, the middle panel shows uh, a nearby spiral galaxy where the spiral arms are seen clearly in the green um, and the red emission actually is X-ray emission uh, in this particular uh, uh, galaxy. And the blue or pink emission that you see is actually radio emission. And here you can see, you can actually resolve that core into some kind of a core jet structure. Like you can see uh, bipolar uh, outflows in this particular source, but the, so the extent of these bipolar, uh, bipolar outflows is extremely small. So these are of the order of a few hundred parsec. They're small. Okay, and I will show you another image which where I will tell you that the other sources like 3C273, the outflows are usually hundreds of kiloparsecs in extent. So they're very, very, very large. And, um, but these Seaford galaxies have small jets and these jets are even smaller than the galaxy themselves. Now, um, the bottom panel uh, is also another Seaford uh, uh, galaxy where you see the disk emission, you see the green emission that you see is the galaxy, which is actually edge on. So you don't see the spiral arms very well, but the white contours there are showing radio emission. So you see these kind of bubble like structures, which are um, being ejected. The extent of these bubbles are typically of the order of 10 kiloparsec. 
okay so not much larger so not still hundreds of kiloparsecs just 10 kiloparsecs so uh, so when seaford galaxies were looked at uh, with radio telescopes so this is what was found either point sources or small jets or if they did see some kiloparsec scale jets they were usually of the order of a few kiloparsec now when this was first found as you can see already you don't see uh, very clear jets so it was not um, Mm, it was not certain what was actually giving rise to these uh, this radio emission. So the origin of these radio lobes was debated. Um, so as late as 1993, um, um, several astronomers were saying that these kind of outflows are actually from uh, starburst superwinds. That means that you have a lot of uh, stars in the center. A lot of them are then going supernovae. They're dying. and when they when the star goes supernova then the it actually ejects uh, it emits synchrotron emission um just like what you see in the agn jets and uh, so it will look very similar it will have very similar properties uh, to the radio jets and uh, yeah, this is they're not looking very collimated they could be just winds rather than jets so they could be actually a star burst superwind um but there was already a lot of debate in the literature and there were authors who were saying that the lobes in these galaxies look different from you know the emission that you see in typical starburst galaxies which do not have an agn okay there are some AG, there are starburst galaxies where there is there is no central agn and the radio emission that is coming from those was different from these seaford galaxies so this debate was on is still ongoing uh, about the origin of these radio outflows So now this is a place to talk now put things in perspective and um, so this slide actually shows uh, what, what is known as radio loud radio quiet divide. So Seifert galaxies and liners are uh, called radio quiet objects, which are actually the majority, the vast majority of active galactic nuclei are uh, radio quiet objects. and on the other side you have like 10 to 15% are radio loud objects and uh, there is a formal definition which was given by ken kelleben in their 1989 paper which is that if the radio flux density to the optical flux density that ratio was greater than 10 then an object is classified as a radio loud agn when this ratio is less than 10 it is called a radio quiet agn but an easy way to see to understand the difference is that in seaford galaxies the outflows are usually small as you can see um and on the right side you see a very nice uh, beautiful radio galaxy uh, where the host galaxy which hosts the agn the supermassive black hole central engine is an elliptic galaxy which is seen in the in, in blue light and the red emission that you see are jets which are being ejected from the center of this elliptical galaxy and those jets are large extremely large so you can see that they go way beyond the host galaxy and they are you know they can be uh, hundreds of kiloparsecs to even a few megaparsecs in extent so megaparsec is it actually is covering now intergalactic distances so these are very very large radio sources uh, on the other side you have seifert galaxies which are much smaller now uh, this division that why are only 10% of sources these very large jets but majority of the agn have these small jets so this radio loud radio quiet dichotomy is um, um, a topic of intense you know uh, study and uh, several authors have suggested differences in either black hole masses or um, the spins of the black holes or accretion rates maybe the environments of not just the galaxy environment but the uh, even the in the the environment the jet kind of interact uh, faces when it's uh, ejected from the black hole accretion disk system um and jet medium interaction so in the sense um several astronomers have argued that the jets in seifer galaxies are small because they are uh, ejected in very dense media uh, because there is a lot of um cold gas which is available in spiral galaxies and because of this dense media the jets are not able to propagate very far so this jet medium interaction keeps them stunted and whereas in radio loud sources maybe there isn't this kind of cold gas and uh, the jets are able to freely uh, move out um and also there is this that the jets themselves start very slow in slowly in the radio quiet agent they are non relativistic uh, as opposed to the radio loud agent where the jets are relativistic but there is also an uh, uh, there is also the suggestion that maybe seifert activity itself is short lived 
maybe um, so this is uh, for example sanders in 1984 has a very interesting paper on this and there are other authors who have also kind of concluded the same that um, the lifetime of a seafood galaxy may be large 10 to the 8 years but each of these these radio outflows that you see are actually much short much uh, of a much shorter lifetime of the order of 10 to the you know, four, 10 to the five years. So in that case, you expect that um, a Seaford galaxy will have several of these activity episodes uh, during its lifetime, okay? So the, this is the alternate explanation. It's, so the, in this case, the jets are stunted, not because of the interaction with the environment, but because uh, the activity itself is short-lived. So the, maybe the accretion disk already kind of disappears in 10 to the five years. And there is some, um, uh, some observational evidence which supports this. So here are uh, the images of montage montages I have produced for two Seaford galaxies. There are a couple more. Um, so on the left side is uh, the Seaford galaxy known as Markarian 6. And uh, so there are three panels here you can see in the, gray, the grayscale ones, where you see on the leftmost panel, you see kind of eight figure eight kind of lobes and there is a bright core in the center. That bright core, then you see the top uh, right panel, also resolves into figure eight kind of lobes and has another bright um, core in it, which also then resolves into some kind of a north-south oriented jet. So you see there are multiple, there seem to be multiple activity episodes in this Seaford galaxy. Similarly, on the right side, there's another galaxy, um, Seaford galaxy called NGC 2639. And uh, again, you see that each, there, there seem to be lobes. Um, uh, so for example, the north-south lobes uh, in the top left panel, but this, the core itself then resolves into some kind of an east-west structure. And then the core of that east-west structure then has, shows a BLBI jet in a different position angle. So, um, so this is work that was done by uh, my PhD student, Vinnie Sebastian in 2019. So it, there is, some evidence uh, suggesting that seafood activity is actually short-lived. So what are the replications of the short-lived activity? You should expect uh, that uh, if the activity is short-lived, you should expect that there should be some emission, some emission left behind from an older episode. So these, this emission from an older activity episode uh, is uh, called uh, relic emission. So you should see some kind of relic lobes in seaford galaxies. Um, so this is uh, what we were looking for, for example, for this galaxy. This is the same galaxy which was shown previously. It's called NGC 4235. It was shown in the panel earlier. Maybe I'll just show you very quickly. Uh, the galaxy on the bottom uh, bottom panel is NGC 4235. So you see the host galaxy in that uh, red, uh, sorry, the green um, bar-like structure is the host, is the disk galaxy. And uh, in this particular source we found with the GMRT, when we looked at uh, the source at 325 megahertz and 610 megahertz, uh, there, there seemed to be some kind of um, uh, diffuse emission surrounding the lobe that you, the, the primary lobe. And um, so the left panel is just the contour image of that. And the right panel is the contour image uh, with the color pixels showing the spectral indices. And the spectral index was made using 325 and 610 megahertz from GMRT. Uh, so you can see the colors, the green and the blue is where the emission gets very steep. So there seems to be the, the diffuse emission around the main lobe which has a uh, flat kind of flatter picture and this is, uh, is actually much steeper. So the lobe alpha of the primary lobe, for example, the lobe on the uh, west has a spectral index of minus 0.6, but the relic lobe has a spectral index of minus 1.8. So it's, it's much, much steeper. So maybe, maybe we're not still sure uh, maybe this is an indication of a relic lobe. And so this is consistent with the idea that um, CFID activity is episodic. So with this kind of, so this was one source, it was a deep observation of a source. With this, um, this result kind of excited us and motivated us to uh, look at a larger sample or, or larger samples of CFID galaxies with GMRT at low frequencies. So the idea is, so, uh, uh, relic emission, um, 
if it's older emission, basically the the charged particles have aged, and uh, so you know that electrons which are emitting higher frequency synchrotron emission will always have sh smaller ages, and electrons which are emitting low frequency photons will have larger, uh, longer ages. So that's why you end up um, uh, discovering these this um, uh, aging emission at uh, mega megahertz, hundred megahertz frequencies with the GMRT. So GMRT is a perfect instrument to actually look for this kind of old emission, old synchrotron emission. So, so with that intention, we have we've looked at several samples of Seifert's and liners, and um, so this is uh, right now. This work is uh, being headed by NCRA postdoc Sumana Nandi and uh, Ruby Noor Khatun. And on the right, uh, uh, two images are actually two Seifert galaxies, but this is at a one. Uh, this is slightly higher frequency at 1.4 gigahertz. So you see nice looking core jet structures with GMRT. These are. Um, the, the extent is still of the order of 10 kiloparsec, not, lo not longer, but they, here you don't see actually bubbles, you see actually nice looking jets, which almost look like just smaller versions of, you know, the FR1 radio galaxies, which I haven't really talked about, but basically these are radio loud AGN, which I showed you in a uh, previous slide, which has um, uh, the radio loud AGN example slide. Uh, that was a Fanner of Riley type one radio galaxy. So this looks like a Fanner of Riley type one radio galaxy, but smaller. However, most of the GMRT uh, data uh, actually don't reveal such beautiful code jet structures. Um, you mostly see point sources. And uh, sometimes you see point sources surrounded by some diffuse emission. But then this diffuse emission turns out to be actually emission from the galaxy itself. So uh, this is an image of NGC 4051. So the left panel is the optical image. And you can see the bright point like AGN in the center, but you also see a lot of this blue emission is actually bright stars, bright young stars. And the right panel is the contour, radio contours, uh, from which is basically radio emission com coming from both the AGN and the galaxy itself. Um, and the color pixels here are showing uh, uh, the spectral indices, and these are made using two frequency uh, images uh, for this particular source. That time we only had a VLA image to compare, so uh, that image was made using a VLA GMRT image. And the spectral index uh, turned out to be steep in the center. Uh, around minus 0.6 in the center, but actually flattish, a little bit flat around around that center. So the Asian, it's, it's, which is the center, which is actually unresolved in this particular image, uh, seems to have um, an alpha, which is consistent with what you see in jets in AGN. But the flat emission actually was more consistent with 3 tree emission, which, which uh, you get from um, H2 regions uh, around stars, right? So, so it looked like there was contribution coming from both stars and AGN, and you could actually distinguish them on the basis of the spectral index. Uh, but this was not the typical case. Most cases, uh, like this one, um, here uh, on the top right, you see the color image is actually showing the host galaxy of this, of this particular Seifert, uh, which is NGC 1056. And the green contours, uh, which look very noisy, of course, uh, uh, is the radio emission uh, from GMRT at 325 megahertz. And the bottom, now the, the main panel is the color spectral index image and contours, radio contour images, um, showing that this, the spectral, uh, spectral index of the entire emission is very steep. So you don't see any distinguishing features of where the AGN is or where you know get the galactic emission is coming in. The, 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 the entire um, radio emission seems to be consistent with uh, what you would actually get in um, um, a radio continuum halo. Okay, so that is more related to the star, star formation processes rather than the AGN itself. Okay, so um, uh, when, so the GMRT results have been mixed in that sense that uh, in some cases where you do see a nice looking jet it's very clear that there is an agent outflow uh, but in uh, other cases you see point sources which are agent related but lot of emission from the galaxy itself the stellar emission and so how do you distinguish between you know the agn and star formation and this is a problem which is uh, which is i like i mentioned uh, even earlier that this problem of what is a radio lobe 
in a CFET galaxy? Is it actually emission from the agent or is it from stars? Is something that gets even more complicated. So the next thing for us to look at, which uh, uh, which we did was to look at polarization emission from all these CFET galaxies. So um, uh, why do you, I mean, of course, the, the fact that this is synchrotron emission, it means that it's very highly uh, linearly polarized. Okay, so, so as high as 75% polarized. So polarization, when you look at uh, polarimetric, when you carry out pol polarimetric observations of um, the lobes of these galaxies, you find them to be highly polarized. So in this, again, the contour image here uh, on the left shows this bubble-like structure of Mercurian 6, which I already showed you the grayscale uh, image of. And the ticks, the um, uh, vectors that you see are the polarization electric vectors. And the, it's the length of these electric vectors are proportional to the degree of polarization. So the larger the length, uh, the more the uh, degree of polarization. Now, the thing to remember here um, is that for optically thin emission, which is what uh, these lobes are, the magnetic field a orientation is perpendicular to the electric vectors, right? That is just the geometry uh, of the synchrotron emission itself. So, um, so now from these images, you can infer uh, what is the magnetic field structure like. So what you see is the magnetic field structures seem to be always aligned following the lobe edges in the secret galaxy. And this we are finding consistently in other CFA galaxies. So now uh, on the right, uh, there is another um, galaxy, NGC 3079. This, is, uh, this work was actually uh, part of the PhD thesis work of Benny Sebastian. And this is one of the sources in her sample. Uh, here, uh, the, again, the ticks are in red now. And uh, you have to, of course, always, you have to imagine now what the B field structure is going to be, which is to be perpendicular to the ticks that you see. And so they all always end up being aligned with the lobe edges. So we seem to we seem to be finding this pattern. Here are two, two more images. Now uh, here on the left is NGC forty three eighty eight. The emission that you see in the east west direction is actually radio emission from the host galaxy, and the uh, north south outflow is actually the agent outflow. So you see emission uh, radio emission coming from the host galaxy, which is stars. And then there's radio emission coming from the agent, which is north south. And the radio emission from the agent seems to be much more polarized on these spatial scales. Um, and you can see the ticks, uh, the red ticks uh, also seem to show that the B field in the center of that outflow uh, seems to be kind of poloidal, but at the edge of the lobe, it seems to be aligned with the edge of the lobe. Okay. And similarly, here in GC5506 on the right. Again, uh, this is more uh, kind of a core jet outflow, but it's pointing towards us, and there is not much emission from the host galaxy itself. And so now, this is imagine there's a core jet, uh, or rather, core lobe out, which is kind of pointing towards you. Uh, so that is why it's very compact. Uh, but again, uh, the from the electric vectors, it, it looks like the B fields are aligned with the edges of the lobes. So this slide is to just show you that we have very recently started carrying out polarization observations with the GMRT um, at uh, 610 megahertz and 1.4 gigahertz. And this is an image from the GMRT of 3 Zwicky 2, which is a very famous uh, CFA galaxy. On the right, you see uh, the color is the optical image. Um, I think this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of 3 Zwicky 2, which shows these beautiful spiral arms, etc. The green contours is radio emission from the VLA. And on the right um, panel, the uh, black contours are radio emission from the GMRT and the red ticks are polarized emission from this source. So there's, uh, so first of all, we detect polarization with the GMRT. Uh, it uh, actually matches also what we see with the VLA polarization. But more interestingly, you see a lot of diffuse emission, which is missed in the VLA observations, but it's actually picked up in the GMRT observation. So you see some kind of a misaligned radio lobe, uh, which is not clear, visible at all in the VLA images. So that's another, um, the, the power of, uh, you know, observing at low radio frequencies. And so this is, this is work that's um, being carried out by uh, my, uh, another PhD student called Shilpa Shachikumar, and this is a paper under review. So now let me, uh, so I've shown you um, uh, the, 
kiloparsec scale radio structures of secret galaxies. And I've already mentioned that most of the time you actually just see point sources. So these are four sources, four galaxies. You see the spiral hosts and you see the point sources. So does it mean that these sources don't have jets? So in order to check that, we then went to high resolution. So you did um, VLBI observation of these CFIT galaxies, and we did dual frequency VLBI observations at 1.5 and 5 gigahertz of a small sample of secrets and liners. Now, uh, interestingly, as, uh, as an additional thing, uh, these particular sources that we chose also seem to have a peculiar emission line spectrum. So you, they seem to show these lines, they sh of course, that is the signature of an AGN, uh, but these lines sometimes have uh, double peaks rather than a single peak. And such kind of sources, or also known as deep, double peaked AGN, uh, have been suggested to be candidates of, you know, uh, which are having not just one supermassive black hole, but two supermassive black holes. And the idea is that each black hole has a narrow line region associated with it. So when you have two black holes, then you will have two narrow line regions and you will have two uh, peaks in the lines. And there are other explanations also for these. So these, but these sources have these additional qualities. Now, let me just show you what we found when we did, uh, we carried out the VLBI imaging of these sources, which looked very, very boring in our, um, you know, the VLA and GMRT images, they look like point sources. But when you look at them with VLBI, you start seeing jets. So this image on the bottom panel um, is actually showing, and the red line is to kind of uh, point, direct your eye to the, the emission, which is all uh, uh, actually uh, a jet. So you miss some of the emission in between the compact regions because um, VLBI is not sensitive to diffuse emission. So you pick up only the bright compact regions. So you see a jet and this jet is 150 parsec long. Mm, it's a long jet. It seemed the spectrum uh, that we got because we had two frequency data uh, is steep. Now, the interesting thing here was that this jet is one sided. You see a core jet structure, uh, just like what you saw, for example, in M87, the slide that I showed you earlier, which could indicate that these jets are relativistic, just like you see in Radio Loud AGN. And in fact, if you kind of do a very first order calculation to see um, if you just, you know, do uh, surface brightness uh, uh, ratio between the jet core jet and the core counter jet in the in this uh, actually you don't see any counter jet emission so you take the noise in the counter jet direction as some kind of an upper limit then you can kind of see what speeds of jets um, will produce this kind of surface brightness uh, intensity uh, ratio and that turns out to be high so velocity is a 0.75 assuming inclinations of let's say 50 degrees so this 50 degree I have chosen because um, this these particular AGN are type 2 AGN. So type 2 AGNs are the ones where we think the torus actually blocks our line of sight to the broad line region. So you only see the narrow lines. And uh, from other calculations, it has been suggested that the half opening angle of the torus is 50 degrees. Okay, so uh, this is something I can discuss with you if, if you're interested later. Okay, I've somehow got stuck again, strange. Okay, I don't know. Oh. One second, I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, Okay, it moved. Okay, fine. Uh, so this is another source where we found another long jet, 200 parsecs long jet. And the spectral index image also seems to show that the emission is steep throughout. Uh, more sources with jets. Um, these are of the order of t tens of parsec long. And, but in most cases, um, it seems to be like a one-sided jet, which again, I mean, if you believe that this one-sidedness is due to Doppler boosting, it means that the speeds of the jets are high. Uh, so we found that in the nine sources we looked at and eight, which we detected with VLBI, 60%, uh, more than 60% had jets, okay? And the speeds, the jet speeds that were implied were ranging from uh, 0.003 C, the C uh, being speed of light, to 0.75 C, so relativistic. 
So the primary findings uh, from this work has been that uh, VLBI detects jets in these sources, which are point sources, uh, uh, you know, with the VLA and the and the VLBI. And it looks more like we didn't since since we didn't actually find signatures of binary black holes. Maybe we should have seen you know multiple or two radio cores. We didn't see these, so it's possible that double peak lines are not due to binary black holes in these AGM. And maybe the jet is somehow moving the clouds in you know um, away from us and towards us to kind of give these um, uh, double peak lines. But what was interesting was that when we estimated uh, their kinetic parts of these you know, 100 parts of scale jets um, using certain uh, empirical formulae that have been derived in the literature. Uh, these numbers are of the order of 10 to the 41, 10 to the 43 ergs per second, which then start getting very close to what you see in the Fanner of Riley type one radio galaxies, which are radio loud AGM. So the jet kinetic powers start getting close to the radio loud AGM jet kinetic powers. So it, this was already suggesting that there was, could there be a continuum in properties going from radio quiet AGM to radio loud AGM? So before I finish my talk very quickly, I just wanted to um, show one very interesting source we, we found uh, uh, just by chance. And this is NGC 2329. Uh, and this this um, work was actually uh, finalized by one of the visiting students at uh, at NCRA called Samidip Das, and this is uh, paper got accepted just last month. Uh, so uh, let me just say, show something interesting here. So uh, on the uh, left panel, you see the contour image of uh, uh, what looks like a Fanner of Riley Type One radio galaxy with 100 kiloparsec scale lobes, and the core a bright core. But the bright core on the right is shown, uh, is zoomed in, and you see the right, the core itself looks like a double, you know, eight figure kind of seafoot like outflow, which you've seen many images of. So, it, this morphology wise, it looked like the core seemed to have a seafoot like uh, lobe, and the, and the lobes, the large scale lobes were like FR1. So, uh, FR1s are radio loud AGN, seafoots are radio quiet AGN. So, it looked like morphology wise, could there be like two different episodes um, in the same source? So, that was very intriguing. And so um, this particular source has, of course, been studied a lot in the literature. Um, and Westerbock observations of, of this particular source was carried out um, in, in the 1980s, long ago. Um, and so what this, I'm showing two images from published data from Ferretti et al. And again, the, big, uh, the ticks here are polarization vectors. And now for uh, the B field structures, you imagine that they are perpendicular uh, to the electric vectors. So what you see in the FR1 lobes is some kind of a spine sheet structure, the spine with uh, B fields perpendicular to the outflows and the sheath which has B fields aligned with the edges. Okay, so this is an F. This kind of a spine tree structure has actually been observed on, on BLBI scales in a lot of sources and also optical uh, polarization observations have indicated this kind of a structure. But the, the polarization structure in the core itself is not very clear. So we uh, looked at the data from the literature. We actually just reduced data from the literature uh, from uh, the VLA. And what we found very interestingly was, so in now the left panel again, uh, here I've done one extra thing. I have already rotated the position vectors by 90 degrees to show you the B field structures. So in the FR1 structure, you'd still see that, you know, the spine of the, you know, the jet or the lobe, which is perpendicular B field, you miss the sheath because these are higher resolution observations. So you miss that diffuse emission. But look at the panel, uh, the right panel. Now this is the polarization in the core, which seem to show the seafoot like outflow. And you see immediately the B fields, which are aligned with the edges, just like you see in seafoot galaxies. I showed you uh, many images of those. So, so these are all, uh, these, of course, these are very new results. Um, and we're still trying to tie up everything uh, that we found so far. Uh, but uh, we really got excited by these results. So, um, uh, so let me just now summarize that radio outflows and radio quiet agent, which includes seafoots and uh, liners, uh, is not fully understood. Um, and so we've been probing these outflows using different telescopes, GMRT, VLA, VLBI, and this actually then um, uh, probes emission on kiloparsec scales and hundreds of parsec scales to parsec scales. 
We have found some indications of radio relics in low frequency observations, but not many. But we have found 100. 10 to 100 parsec scale jets in VLBI observations of sources which were point sources. Polar, polarization observations seem to kind of reveal a characteristic briefing structure in these, uh, in these lobes. Um, and overall, we're finding, uh, including the, you know, the result that I just showed in the previous slide, that um, our results are, cons are basically consistent with the idea that seaford activity is short-lived. And that is the reason why their jets are small. Um, and uh, and so the fact that we could have some kind of a seaport like an FR one like outflow in the same AGN suggests that it's the accretion rate which is the most important factor. So if the accretion rate changes and that then decides the accretion disk state, then that kind of gives you uh, you know one kind of outflow versus the other. So the final point is that the radio law radio quiet divide it's it's probably not a very sharp divide and it might not be un insurmountable. So I'll stop here and I'll be happy to take questions. I don't know if I um, uh, exceeded my time or anything. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Preeti, for that wonderful talk. Um, we still have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, so if, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, enter them in chat or unmute yourself and... Uh, <laughs> ask the question directly. Yeah. While we oh, hello. Are, sorry, there's a question already. OK. I, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, uh, given that you've been looking at a lot of the, uh, the best known nearby AGN and you seem to be finding jets in all of them, are there any examples where even though these are nearby objects, they're very clear, and you should be seeing jets if they're there. You found evidence that there's no jet whatsoever. In the nearby sources? Yes, in any of the sources you looked at where you, in other words, have you, have you found any AGN where there's no jet? Or um, yeah, yeah. Find a good enough data, you will see something. Right. Um, okay, that's, that's a good question. So. If we, there are some sources where we don't find jets, but we do still find radio core emission. So you do see the base of the jet or what we think is the base of the jet, but no um, extended emission, uh, which looks like a jet. Um, there are some sources, of course, which are not detected with the VLBI. So of course, there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, so that probably just requires us to be become um, go more sensitive. But um, uh, the sources which show only codes, I don't think we can still rule out if jets were never present or, you know, uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, maybe a more sensitive observation would have picked some jet emission. Um, so I don't know how to so the answer to the question is that even though we do have sources where you only see cores in VLBI images, that we still can't rule out the presence of jets in those. Okay. All right. Thanks. I had a really naive question. Uh, the last okay. galaxy which you showed, NGC two three two nine. Do you know what is what is the optical host galaxy? Is it an yeah. elliptic or a spiral? It's a, it's an it's an S zero. Ah, okay. Yeah, so it's like it's really everything is at the border. Yeah. Yeah. But I I did I Sam you had mentioned that there were a lot of students here. I'm sorry. I think I didn't make it uh, accessible to the students. But I, if they have any questions, I'm very happy to you know uh, discuss. Okay, so I see some uh, message in the chat. Uh, could the secret galaxy jets be limited by magnetic fields surrounding the Asian? Can the levels of the magnetic fields around the Asian be measured and compared? Okay. Um, so when you say magnetic fields surrounding the Asian, you mean actually uh, magnetic fields in the black hole equation system, I assume? 
and um, around the engine, I hope you don't need magnetic fields outside of the central engine. So let me just assume that uh, what you mean is magnetic fields in the engine itself. So um, I think that is actually that's a that's a good question because I mean when you when we are talking about different accretion rates and different accretion disk states, I think there has to be some implication also for the magnetic field structures which are threading these accretion disks. So there has to be uh, there must be something, maybe some difference between the um, you know the the fields to start with. But I, I, I don't think I can say much more than that. But um, levels of magnetic fields around the agent we measure and compare. OK, so to get the magnetic field, so what we do in our polarization observations, what we get actually are just the magnetic field orientations, because you get polarization electric vector orientations, and you get magnetic field orientations, uh, assuming optically thin emission. Uh, but you don't get magnetic field strengths. OK, so usually for magnetic field strengths uh, if it's in a you know extended jet or lobe you use the um, assumption of equipartition and then you uh, kind of get some estimate of the b fields but closer to i mean the, on the blbi scales so or even you know even smaller scales um, it's more difficult to actually get the b field strength so uh, magnetic field strength so those are usually uh, got indirectly through um, core shift, VLBI core shift, core shift uh, measurements, et cetera, which I don't think I want to get into. But uh, uh, I think suffice it to say that magnetic field strengths are not easy to uh, obtain um, in, in these uh, jets and equation disks. OK, thanks. So I also assume that everybody knows about Faraday of Rayleigh radio galaxies and everything. I don't know. Have you had um, other Asian talks as well? Uh, yes, uh, we have had uh, other Asian talks as well. And as a matter of fact, I did spy uh, Bernie as uh, ah, attending the talk. Uh, earlier. That would be wonderful. So <laughs> Bernie can definitely tell us uh, about those. Uh, I think he has left uh, okay. because we are well past four now. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's safe to assume people do know about the Fener of Riley. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, so if there are no further uh, questions, um, and uh, PT, may I share your email address in case uh, the students okay. have any? Okay. Uh, please, uh, please ask any further questions uh, via the email um, uh, to the speaker. And before we close, uh, join me in a round of applause for the speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.